This is such a great turnout. I appreciate your presence and interest in this topic. Um, so I feel the best way for me to describe these uh, design methods and systems is to showcase some of our own projects. Um, people love photos and real life examples and um, looking at others who have gone forward ahead of, uh, of you in some cases if you're planning to endeavor on this path. Um, look at what worked, what didn't. You know, in, in each progress process there's a learning curve involved. Um, so we'll try to give you a um, full range of, of uh, their experiences. Um, just as a, a launching out point, I've, there's a lot of terms out there uh, being used, and sustainability is a really a catchphrase that we're hearing quite often in, in many segments, um, whether it's product or design or economy or you know whatever it may be that you're into. You've likely heard um, about sustainability and sustainable building. We've also heard the term green. Um, also the natural building movement. And really, um, what we believe is that green, sustainable design, whatever term you want to use, um, is really synonymous with good design. Um, it's our responsibility, um, whatever profession you're in, if you're an attorney, a doctor, an architect, really is to take care of your clients and the people that you're serving. Um, so really the basic premise in our work, and I believe the work of, of many um, sustainable designers, is to uh, create healthy, um, healthy spaces for people to inhabit, as well as efficient so it can um, serve them for the long term and durable and environmentally friendly um, because we can and we should um, be responsible um, stewards of the environment. And really it, it encompasses everything from grass huts to you know, more high tech solutions. There's a whole gamut of, of grain out there. Um, there's not, you know, back in the 70s when we had the you know, first sort of awakening of, of trying to design for solar, um, there were a lot of really poorly designed structures out there, basically your modified chicken coop with a wall of glass, and it really turned a lot of people off um, aesthetically, and they felt that they didn't want to live in a solar home. Now I think there's a lot of creative solutions coupled with technology that have um, basically provided a design response appropriate <coughs> to any given situation. Again, everybody's coming at sustainability from a different um, aspect. We have a lot of um, clients that come to us because you know, of a personal philosophy that they feel they want to exemplify their personal ethic of stewardship in the place that they live in, in the uh, lifestyle that they have. They feel that you know, whether it's an urban setting um, where you're using public transportation to a rural setting where you're harvesting your own food. Um, again, there's a full range of choices there. Um, Health is a, is a large one. We have a lot of um, you know, design for families and people with children consider even more so the health aspects of what our buildings have um, that comprise them. Everything from you know the ceilings to the wall finishes and flooring and there's you know thousands, tens of thousands of chemicals and products um, that we install in our buildings and very rarely do we look at sort of the nutrition label of those. Are they good for us? Are they bad for us? If so, you know, how bad are they? So health is a, a big aspect of this, and that doesn't necessarily, you know, tie into we're not going to save the planet by putting in low VOC. We're going to save ourselves. So it's really um, about doing the right thing for ourselves as well. Um, so I like, you know, I think William McDonough um, is an architect that speaks internationally and promotes concepts of sustainability, and he really sums it up: of, you know, Do I like it? Does it work? And can I afford it? Really, all of our decisions come down to those basic elements: um, you know, functionality, budget, aesthetics. And so um, any project, again, whether it's architecture or any other segments, um, really considers these basic premises. I'm going to dive into some specifics of, of design strategies. Um, people ask, how much does green cost? Well, you know, it really depends. <laughs> That's not always the preferred answer. But we try to take the approach of looking at the free given elements that you can take advantage of um, as you're planning a project. And this obviously is easier with new construction than it is in retrofits, but it still is um, possible with retrofit applications. But look at the resources that you have available to you. Um, look at the wind, look at the sun, look at views and access and site amenities and transportation. All of those, when you're selecting your location, all of those <coughs> really encompass the decision of um, where to build, how to build, and um, whether or not 
build and live in that specific location. <coughs> so by simply orientating the building the proper way, um, looking at these natural systems, you can for free capture these elements just through basic design. Um, this is one example. It was a, a <coughs> remodel addition um, on Mill, Mill Creek, and uh, the existing structure related very poorly to the side. It didn't. It was right adjacent to the creek. It didn't have views. It didn't have good access, um, and the landscape was planted with vegetation that you couldn't access. This is actually buffalo grass. It looks quite green in this photo. I don't know if it's been enhanced, but it's drought tolerant buffalo grass has been planted. Um, the home has been opened up to the site to catch the actual breezes um, and the cooling effects of the nearby stream. Um, placement of, this is the south elevation. You'll get a clue on the south elevation and green design if it has a lot of windows. <laughs> um, so basically by, this is all a window here, we have a combination of operable shading so that you can control the amount of sunlight entering the space through the year. Um, passive solar is a little bit tricky in that you know, we know the sun will be higher in the asthmus in the summer and lower in the winter, so with broad overhangs, we can block that sun. But um, it's not symmetrical with the heating season, so we have a little bit of a delay from when we want more shading um, when we actually have it with its shading devices. They have then some more shading here. They actually you can see how close the vegetation is to this house. This was an addition right here, but they've tucked every uh, new element of this uh, building into and up against vegetation that was preserved to and kind of provide that shade and shelter and cooling effect. Um, this was an entry tower added um, off to the west and we have a combination of high operable windows here and it's a three-story space so in effect it can draw draw cool air and off the south lower elevations the creek side and with a, a ceiling fan and operable windows help to ventilate all three levels through this cooling tower. They actually have a planted, this is the, the precursor to their planted roof system on the addition. Um, basically it's over a membrane roof with hands to contain soil and that's a great uh, element in um, visually extending the site and landscape and creating more green space, if you will, for the smaller inhabitants of the site. Um, but it also is great in protecting the roof um, from the elements. It will never see the sun harsh, you know, harsh weather conditions, so it extends the life of the roof, and it also provides thermal insulation to the structure as well. So, um, in green design, I think when you start to talk about cost-benefit, if you can look at one simple strategy that can have a multitude of benefits, such as a planted roof, for instance, um, you're spending a little bit more money there, but you're getting, you know, the benefits, again, of durability, of efficiency, and of aesthetics, which is a value as well. How you lay your, uh, besides the basic orientation of the building on the site, we need to look at orientation of spaces within that structure. Um, common sense, you just want to place, as if this is the south side, you want to group your main living areas on that elevation to take advantage of the sunlight and warmth that you would need to function in those spaces. And then use buffer spaces such as laundry rooms, utility, storage, along the back. Again, that's not costing more money, it's just proper planning, but it can have a, a great energy impact in terms of not needing um, artificial light throughout the day to use commonly used spaces to provide warmth and heating in spaces as well that you're commonly occupying. Again, extending the discussion of passive solar, the window type and placement is critical. Um, we try to minimize the amount of, of window on the west exposure, um, especially in our climate for overheating. It's very hard to control the amount of sun coming in a western exposure because as the sun drops low in, in the horizon, it's just a direct line of sight. Anybody that lives on the east bench or well attested to, you have those large, fabulous picture windows for the view, but if the shades are drawn because you can't stand the glare, you're not really capitalizing on the view so much. So you really need to kind of balance again the desire for views um, with energy performance as well as comfort. It's just uncomfortable to be in those types of spaces. So a preferred method is to um, you know, maximize the southern exposure to a point, and this diagram describes what's happening in this photograph. Um, these are south windows, and again, we're shading the windows in the summertime through these overhangs, and we actually have a clear story, which is this band of upper windows that you see. 
so that we can reflect light off of these metallic shelves and deep into the space so that in the summertime, when we're shading and blocking light and heat out of the space, it's not creating a dark cave-like atmosphere. You still have reflected, diffused light in the space. So um, we're getting daylight coupled with passive solar strategies. And we'll have time for question and answers at the end, by the way. <laughs> but if there's something pressing along the way, please feel free to ask questions if the diagram doesn't look like And then taking that a step further, um, we talked about um, the daylighting aspect. And what do you do with the heat that enters the space in a passive solar building? You need to capture it and store it through some method. And typically thermal mass is the best method. Um, water is a great method, but you know, it's not always appropriate or practical in architecture to uh, store water. Um, this is exposed concrete floor. We typically um, you know, take this approach for, again, a number of reasons. You take one method and you have multiple benefits. So our concrete slab on grade is structural. It's basically laid down as the structural floor system. Um, it houses an in-floor radiant heat system which radiates through this thermal mass and is very comfortable to the touch, so it's not a cold hard floor. It's very durable, easy to clean. Um, you can eliminate a lot of indoor chemical pollution by having clean floors. Things that are tracked in from the outside. Carpet is sort of the, the worst case scenario. Um, in, indoor, as far as air quality goes, it just traps and harbors a lot of dust and particles, pollution brought in. So a nice, hard, quick, clean surface. It's great for that. And this also works well coupled with the passive solar. As the sun beams are entering the building, it's being absorbed by this thermal mass as well. So you have, again, many benefits going on here in this method. And of course, once you capture this heat, you need to keep it in the building. So a nice, well-insulated, um, tight envelope, which is what we call the walls, the floor, walls, and roof envelope of the building to contain <coughs> the heat in the space. Um, just a few examples of some daylighting strategies as it relates to different architectural solutions. Um, this is a south face, and we have sort of a boardwalk here that bridges so that we can have um, bring a lot of daylight in this. This is a corridor, um, a stairwell here, and we wanted to create a nice light open space on the interior. This is a southern exposure to the bathroom, and it just shows how you can use interior materials um, to define spaces. This is bamboo floor, and this is a slate floor here. And the slate serves not only as a wet surface for the shower and tub area, and there's a step down here to contain that moisture, but it also you know, is a place to gather that sunlight in a dark, um, heat absorptive material. So it, it, it's aesthetic, but there are other more technical reasons for doing it as well. If you can, so many times you can couple that and get a lot of bang for your buck. Um, again, daylighting, we have, um, we used a three-form panel, which is a locally produced um, recycled resin panel that um, is, is great for separating and dividing <coughs> space and allowing daylight to penetrate through. This is basically separating the shower space from you know, the platform and vanity area. Um, in the same house, this is the inside of that wall. We just saw perforated with the small windows. Um, we have an open stairwell so that, again, this is the we would call a basement or a walkout. And um, you know, to bring as much light as possible, we have these windows and the stairs sort of floats in front of that system. And then the openings and the risers allow light again to penetrate through so you don't feel like you're compressed into a cave-like space. You don't need to turn lights on you know, throughout the day as you're moving through the house in any space. And then we use that three-form panel again. Um, this is the only room in the lower level that does not have direct daylight. It's an occupied space and it's a guest bathroom. So this is a translucent panel that allows that daylight to penetrate through that entire wall. It's a 10-foot long wall of translucent glass. Again, concrete, stained concrete floors. And you can score them and color them in different colors and textures to make them look like tiles. So getting into uh, materials a bit, um, I mentioned at the start that indoor air quality and health is really of utmost concern, I believe, as far as um, our responsibility to our clients that we're serving. And um, really, I think there's too much off the <coughs> You know, the same goes in the food you buy and consume. Same goes with materials that you put in your building. Um, we put a lot of blind faith into products that we buy off the shelf that they won't harm us. But if you look at the ingredients 
similar to reading a nutrition label, you'll find that um, many are carcinogen. And there's really a you know, fine print at the bottom of the back of the label telling you that much. Um, so you really have to be conscientious shopper and consumer, knowing what to look for, what you'd like to avoid, and in which spaces. You know, I, um, I have two young children, and I know a lot of friends having children at the same time, and the first thing you do is paint the nursery, right? And you have this new vulnerable baby coming into the house, and we paint it without reading that label, and it's really frightening of you know, what they're inhaling um, into these brand new lungs. So we want to really take care to specify the right products and materials to make sure we're providing healthy spaces. Um, we do a lot of detached garages as well. Um, again, a common solution is to stick that garage right onto the kitchen so you can walk in with your groceries, open the door, and boom, you're right there, set them on the counter. But you're tracking in everything that's been on the floor of the garage right into your kitchen. You're opening the door with the fumes from the exhaust of your cars into the kitchen and eating space. And so any separation you can give, whether it's a simple vestibule or at least you have a controlled space um, for climate and ventilation before you get to that space, that can be a big help in air quality as well. Um, <coughs> properly ventilating equipment, um, we typically install a fresh air uh, heat recovery ventilation system. <coughs> the bu building's as tight as you're making um, with green building. You really need to provide air exchange for those seasons when things are closed up tightly and air is not really moving through because inevitably <coughs> things do enter the house and you need to expel them. So. I'm going to take a sip of water. With materials, this is really a fun part for designers because you really get to, this is what people see. They don't see the insulation in the walls typically unless you really make a point to show it. And they don't see the heating system, but it's really the fun stuff to see and showcase. Um, and there's you know many decisions. At the end, the healthy thing is a no-brainer, durable, um, low maintenance. I think a lot of benefits to building green is that it should be you know minimal impact to to maintain and service equipment and materials. Um, they should last because if you're replacing a finish every 10 years, that's not very sustainable no matter where it's come from. So going somewhere into a landfill probably even if it's recyclable. <laughs> so chances are um, the more durable it can be, um, greener it will be, and easier on your lifestyle it will be. And many um, sustainable products are that. This is a recycled, um, actually it's FSC certified wood fiber countertops. Um, that are beautiful. They can be molded and shaped in different forms. They're durable, um, basically kind of loud braided countertops where you can you know, spill things on them and put the temperature on them to a degree. So, um, and then local, buying local, you're probably familiar with you know, the Best Pocket Coalition, Buy Local Utah. Again, that extends to the realm of what we're doing as well. We try to support um, local craftspeople as well as suppliers to create sort of you know economy as well as a availability of these products in our local market so it's easier for us to do our job as well. An efficient utilization of materials. Um, this is an interesting one with design. You know, we see a lot of projects that, you know, look, we used all reclaimed timbers in this project, yet the timbers that they used were this big around and the timber that they required was this big around. So, you know, it's fine and dandy that you're using a salvage material, but let that salvage material go as far as it can so you're not then putting another load on more resources. Um, <coughs> so that's just kind of a design um, aspect to utilizing our material resources efficiently, even those that are coming from a recycled or sustainable source. In construction waste, I want to touch on that. Um, a lot of the products we buy for building or remodeling, um, a good portion of those end up being thrown out immediately before they're ever put into useful life. You buy a sheet of drywall, cut it into pieces, half of it goes away because <laughs> you don't need the full sheet, or you know, buy pieces of lumber, then they get cut up in pieces. And so really, um, through proper planning and design, if you know the system and material that you're going to use, you can lay out your module accordingly. So you're using full sheets of, you know, of plywood or full lengths of studs so that you're not wasting and throwing away perfectly good brand new material. This is a little straw bale house um, level expert point to him right there, Wayne Bingham in the crowd, who builds straw bale as well. Um, and this is in Moab, it's a 750 square foot little uh, guest house. And uh, straw bale is wonderful for many reasons. It's not always appropriate. We don't try to sell it on every project. 
but um, in the right, given the right situation and the right location, availability of straw, which is virtually anywhere, relatively speaking, um, and availability of labor. It's very labor intensive. It's quite fun and can be a very bonding experience, but don't fool yourself into thinking it's sort of a few weekend project. It is uh, a very strong commitment um, to spending the time, but those that have done it, we do a lot of owner builder assisted projects as well. And, it's grueling and you try to get people to help, but inevitably it's your project and you're not going to get 20 volunteers every weekend all summer long. It's just not going to happen. So um, it is planning and it is dedication and commitment to have that happen. Um, Straw Bale has many benefits besides the fact that it's a waste resource and relatively inexpensive to buy as a product. And the expense comes in with the labor, um, but the material itself is cheap and it provides a impeccable insulation value. It's debatable whether it's, I don't know, what do you, what's the debated? Factor now. 35. 35 sounds good. <laughs> people claim 48. Some people say it's less. Some, you know, but in, in any case, it's it's an impeccable system. Um, it's a healthy system. It gets breathable, applied correctly with natural plasters. Um, it allows vapor to permeate through, so it, it kind of controls that indoor environmental quality and moisture in the space. And it's really a, just beautiful, comfortable space to be in. It creates a different feel than your hard, rigid. Um, surface. It's a nice soft undulating system, creates beautiful elements of deep window wells, um, and it's something you can do yourself. Some people want to build for themselves, and they don't want to hire the experts to do it. They want to get in there with their hands and leave their prints behind and experience it. Um, this is a railing that the owner built with salvaged um, wood he found scattered around the area. Um, and the plot, this is natural clay plasters, and you can just do fun creative things. This is a little truth window. Um, to show that, yes, we do have straw walls behind this plaster and show it off. Um, so you can really have some fun with these materials and express yourself in very creative ways. Um, you know, building green, I think uh, size is definitely an issue. Um, there's talks about, you know, the, the green giant that, you know, someone wants to build a 10,000 square foot house, but they're putting in solar, so isn't that great? Well, not necessarily. You really need to look at the big picture, but ultimately, Usually, you know, more compact and smaller plans are better for the environment as well as for yourself. You know, they're going to be less to operate, less to maintain. If something goes wrong, you have to fix something. You know, it's just a smaller footprint to take care of. Um, it's using less resources to construct from the start. Um, so this is, we actually do just apply mud to the walls to finish the walls. It's a mixture of sand and clay, maybe some chopped straw and water, and um, it's just trailed right onto the straw. So it's very natural, forgiving system. Um, I love this photo. This is one of my kids, of course. <laughs> but you know, how many construction sites have you seen barefoot babies running around um, playing in mud and while people are working and building the house? So that's what I love about it. <laughs> uh, it really is empowering for people um, of all ages and abilities. There's something for everyone to do in natural building. You know, there truly is. Of course, you know, you need your foundations, you need your framing, you need your wiring. And those components, but there are really a lot of elements you can get into um, depending on your abilities. I'm not getting close to wrapping, I'm trying to buzz through. Um, this is uh, more of a conventional house for a family of four, Immigration Canyon, again, passive solar exposure. We have some solar hot water panels here on the roof for the domestic heating. Um, they have an 1800 gallon water cistern buried on the side of the house that captures all the rainwater off the rooftop. All of the gutters are diverted to that, and they use that to uh, just simply gravity feed their, or their garden down below. Um, they didn't install a clothes dryer in their house, again, it's sort of a lifestyle item integrated with the architecture. Um, they air dry all their clothes, and saves a tremendous amount of energy. Um, very active outdoor people, and they wanted to uh, have a house that supported their lifestyle. Um, the entire house was built with structural insulated panels. Um, again, there, again, there's no right method or material for every project. It's all kind of a case by case. And in this case, we use you know, the walls and roof. Um, our panel system is basically you know, a sandwich of OSB, which is particles of wood board, insulation, and another OSB, and they're tilted up. It's almost like a combination of a custom prefab home because you have these panels shipped to the site pre-cut with window openings numbered where they go, and it's a very simple tilt-up system in most cases. If you have a complicated design, it doesn't lend itself to a lot of the system. Um, so you know, kind of the basics of you know very healthy house, combination of materials. Again, we sort of see here 
the south exposure, we had a, a band of dark tile again for that heat absorption ability and then transition to band floor here. Um, clear story windows above these we can help bring the daylight deeper into the space, but they're also operable to help ventilate passively. There's no air conditioning in this house, and it's just up immigration. Um, and they've been comfortable, you know, several years now, just through tightening up the house during the day, opening up at night, and letting it ventilate out. Um, the rainwater is there escaping. It's pretty standard on these projects. Materials. We use some salvaged wood on some select areas of the finish. Um, indoor air. So, um, sort of talking about the carpet issue. And you say, well, what about kids crawling on the floor and sitting on the floor in play spaces? Cork is a great alternative material to carpet. Um, it's very comfortable to be barefoot sitting on. It's soft and forgiving. It's great in kitchens. If you drop something, it's not going to shatter. Um, it's very easy on the legs to work at. So. There's some fun alternatives out there to the traditional method. And it's going to last a heck of a lot longer than carpet. There are port floor installations that have been, you know, 80 years in, in commercial applications, so it's very durable. Um, are we out of, no, you had to wait 10. Okay, so I want time for questions, yes. Yeah, so. okay. This is uh, our little office. This is an example of kind of historic rehab, if you will. I think um, kind of the greatest thing you can do truly is to remodel something that's existing, reuse, a building that's already existing. Um, you also do have a sort of complication of. Sorry, where's your office? It's on 900 East and between 3rd and 4th South. It's Rose Laundromat, IHC. Just a little subtle little green house. <laughs> but this was a before, and I just loved it because it was full of potential. And um, so, you know, you have the combination of trying to balance the historic aspects and aesthetics with energy demands and how far do you go without completely ripping something down and really maximizing the existing um, structure that you're left with. So we had some structural work to do. We had to shore up foundations. We had to do all the wiring. We had to you know, replace all the windows, but we kind of replaced the lower windows with wood windows, you know, all insulated. And, um, but with the upper addition, we had a bit of a modern extension that speaks to this is when we built this part and this is when that was built. So we're not trying to fake in a, his, a historic addition on, on the building. Um, light colored roof for reflectivity so you're not heating up the space within. Um, also putting down an urban heat island effect which is basically the notion that with all these black top surfaces and black top roofs in the urban setting, that it, it raises the ambient temperature throughout the entire area. So it's, it helps not only your own structure but being a good neighbor. Um, let's see. Zero escaped it, just drive by. Um, durable materials. We have a little bit, you know, some selective salvaged wood in some places and recycled steel, super durable. Don't have to mess around with it. Um, we just put in a small uh, instantaneous hot water heater because, you know, it's just a few of us washing hands occasionally. We don't need to keep a huge tank of hot water heated and um, using energy to do that. So that's a very efficient system in applications. Even in, you know, houses where you're using it on a daily basis, on demand water heaters can be a great efficient system. And then indoor, you know, we actually use the cork in our part of our office. And in the summer, I love to kick off the shoes and walk out of barefoot. It's very comfortable. And you know, giving people a place to work that is light and bright, so they can open a window, get some fresh air, I think is really critical and rare these days in um, office settings. So that really appealed to me with this space. And you know, I, all the finishes and paints for see actually the, the trim work is a natural bio-based paint that um, it literally had no smell and it was a joy to work with and very good quality. So a lot of times, you know, these formulations for the low VOC are, are newer on the market, so they've been tested and, and have more um, more current methods in, in, in chemistry, if you will, so they're technically better quality overall. So just wrapping up, um, I just hope that we've kind of exemplified that you know, we're not the enemy <laughs> on the planet, I hope, and I think there are ways that we can solve our existence um, through good design and creativity so that we're really um, work, you know, living with our environments and making and using the resources we have available to us and not creating just a damaging footprint everywhere we go. Um, and so I think just redesigning your way of thinking and planning, you can um, provide the tools for a healthier future. <coughs> 
of course, there's the plug the book and um, my contact information if anybody wants to follow up with any of the questions. But I'll take questions. What do you think is the <coughs> principal barrier to not having more of these kinds of designs in this valley or in, in this country? I mean, when you when you drive Bangarder Highway and you see the tract housing, there are real and perceived barriers, no doubt. Um, Again, the cost issue comes up. People are frightened by, you know, they go to the product store and they can, you can easily see, you know, this tile versus this tile. Well, the recycled tile is twice as much. Why should I buy that? You know, so there are tough choices to make in terms of cost. But again, if, you know, through proper planning and design, I think it's just people getting informed as to how these systems work and how simple it can be and seeing more examples. It's just not, um, and people drive through a neighborhood and they see that house and say, I want that house too, but with this color stucco. And that's as far as their design choices go often. Um, so I think just really spreading the word, um, getting examples out there that people can see. The Green Building Center has an annual tour of homes, I think is a great method to spread the word. But it's, you know, 500 people in the valley go to that. So um, it's not really in the forefront. But Do you have a rule of thumb for the additional cost? You know, it really depends on where and, and what it is. but. Um, you have to look at, we try to look at sort of the whole life cycle of the building. So we're typically designing for people that plan to be in their home for a period of time. They're not trying to flip it in three years. And so when you start looking in terms of staying in place, then you can look at more options and what makes sense. And then things like, you know, the solar, hot water, and ground source heat pumps, and more insulation, all that is going to pay for itself. How many things, you know, have you bought lately that pay for themselves? <laughs> Not many, you know, your clothing doesn't pay for itself, <coughs> or, you know, the countertop, you know, the granite countertops don't pay for themselves, or just sort of an amenity. So I think, you know, you can sell the ideas that make this initial investment, and build up, people understand investment and return on their investment, um, that it really does make a lot of sense in most cases. <coughs> Looking at these beautiful images and thinking about where I spend most of my day in the basements of university classrooms, um, <laughs> I was wondering, do you see a trend to incorporate these ideas more within a university setting? You, maybe I should ask the Office of Sustainability. <laughs> but, but I mean, can, that, can we have that at the university? Yeah, I don't know how many green conferences I've been to where you're locked up in a cave yeah. with no yeah. light, <laughs> bad air. It's just, yeah, unfortunately, it's a common I'll, I'll toss it out there that I think, and maybe Tammy Cleveland, who's a planner with campus, uh, can help with this uh, a little bit. But we're seeing a rapid shift, I think, and more and more interest in this. Uh, our plan operations director has this book called, uh, what's the title? Buildings, the gift that keeps on taking. Uh, and I think from an operations standpoint, we see that a lot, that we, back to David's point, economics is a real barrier because we tend to look at upfront costing rather than life cycle costing, as Angela's pointing out. And so there's something called value engineering that comes into a proj project. Turns out that that's cut costs up front regardless of what happens down the road, typically. Uh, that's starting to shift, and I also think architects and designers and the deans and various people who control some element of design are starting to look pretty differently at this. I know that, for instance, the new Museum of Natural History is really working hard to be a green, sustainable building uh, to the extent possible. The Sutton Building is a good example, where actually a team of students got involved with a practicum course, and as part of their coursework, put a bunch of green enhancements proposals together. Those are still uh, in the process of being funded. But I think I think we're starting to see that. We're also rarely is it calculated, for instance, productivity or uh, things like reduced sick days or how much better students might do on tests if their rooms were daylighted and they felt comfortable. Those sorts of, inf that sort of information is being researched more and more and is more out there. But I think it really takes people like you to step forward and help us in our office say that this is really what we want to see. Help our donor community see that really this is important to us and also help the legislature understand that it's worth those upfront investments so that down the road we have the kind of campus you feel comfortable on and that returns investment to the taxpayers of Utah. Um, and this is kind of brought up in answering these other two questions. Is, uh, do you know of or have there been any studies yet, I know some of these designs are relatively new at least, a widespread scale, but do you know of any studies or research that's been done ultimately on some of the long-term, like it's been mentioned, the long-term economic value in terms of saving 
uh, they, that, that these houses can produce? Um, more so on the commercial market. Um, U.S. Green Building Council has developed a called LEED rating system, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, back in 97, 98. And it's sort of started at the top of the market of the large-scale office and commercial buildings. And they've done numerous, I don't know how many registered projects they have, but it's basically a third-party rating system um, that people voluntarily enter and get their building and design judged in terms of site planning, water efficiency, energy efficiency, indoor quality. Um, and so they've been able to study now, they have enough sort of uh, data on those existing buildings that have been certified to start to say, these are the paybacks we're starting to see. Um, you, can, you can sort of design um, and try to calculate estimated expenses or modeling tools. You can estimate your expenses, but without actually tracking, because so much of it depends on users habits you, know, you can design the most efficient building in the world but if they're leaving lights on all night long you know it kind of defeats the purpose of this great efficient lighting system so a lot of it comes down to habits and actual usability of the spaces um, but I would check out the US Green Building Council website usgbc.org and, and look for their studies um, on what the cost impacts have been um, residentially uh, you know you should really just I don't know, there's um, Energy Rated Homes of Utah that does the Energy Star rating for <coughs> homes, and they may have some data. They, have, they don't really design for data, but I'm sure they have. Let's see, finally, has this research been favorable to then persuade people to build these kinds of energy? Yeah, I have um, we did one house, our first house with ground source heat pump. It's basically you know, tapping the Earth's energy to heat. And uh, it's about 3,300 square foot house, um, and they had. They did install air conditioning just for those, you know, worst case scenario days. And their annual, average annual heating and cooling bills are around $600, um, which is pretty reasonable for that size of house. Sometimes, you know, there's homes that have spend that much each month. So. Uh, most of these homes seem like they're designed for colder climates. For what? Colder climates. These are all local projects. So I was thinking uh, <coughs> probably further south, you don't want a lot of that southern exposure lighting. And um, we do. Uh, southern um, exposure is very easy to control, actually. Um, if you want windows, put them on the south because you can shade them the seasons that you want to shade them. And ventilation is key in the warmer climates, um, especially the humid north climates, um, providing a lot of operable spaces and, and you know high clear story operable ventilation systems. But um, yeah, you can rarely go wrong if you, if you size your overhangs properly on the south side. You can rarely go wrong with southern facing windows. I'll come back around to the question of economics and cost and building. Um, as we look at these issues around cost and essentially a risk to some degree, one of the things that we see over and over again is our current market economy spends a lot, is really built around what's called externalities, a lot of cost to the environment that aren't picked up by individuals. So therefore, air quality, for instance, in this valley, um, the air is considered a, a common resource that we can dump pollutants into, essentially at no cost. This is becoming extremely apparent with our issues around climate change. So because there's no cost to putting carbon in the air, that doesn't get factored into a building cost, it essentially distorts the markets. Well, there, now there's a lot of policy, national level policy debate around climate solutions, including a carbon tax. You know, the built environment consumes a large portion of our fossil fuel use in this country and worldwide. I don't know what the figures are, but I'm guessing, you know, at least at the U, when we look at our carbon footprint, the vast majority of that is coming from buildings, even when you take commuting and that sort of thing into consideration. So once we start looking, if we really had to pay the full cost of what we were doing, green building would really be the only way we were building, but basically we've distorted these markets to really push essentially cheap upfront construction and really transfer those costs into future generations. So I would counsel all of you to look a little harder and closer at your pocketbooks and also look and see how we might shift that because a lot of that is policy level choices that we're making by failing to figure out how to integrate those costs more deliberately into the markets for our building. I think um, I, our biggest barrier with our own projects is uh, Finding the labor force willing and interested in building green, to be honest, you know, from the general contractors down to each sub and trade, um, it's a whole, whole new way of doing things. And you know, someone says, "I've been doing it this way for 30 years; it's worked just fine. I'm going to stick with it." 
it's very hard to sway them into a new attitude. Um, for one, they don't want to admit they've been doing it wrong for 30 years, so um, let alone you know, try something that's a little bit of a risk and they're not quite sure of. So um, that's, def I think, a, a barrier to why it's not more widespread, because it's easy just to do the cookie cutter. You know, I've done this, I know what my profit margin is, there's no surprises, you can sell it, because you know Jane has a cousin that's been looking for the same house. So um, you know, that's definitely a barrier for us, too. But, I think with you know more demand from um, people that are purchasing products and purchasing designs to demand certain designs, um, then they'll have to respond. And I've seen that you know just even the community locally. You know, two years ago I was like, nah, maybe I'll maybe I'll get to that in some project, but if I have to, and now clients are saying, yeah, you have to. So they're you know kind of paying attention a little bit more on the design front. So I think it's coming. Kind of my question was about the, the lead certification process. I've heard uh, some articles complaining about how one can gain the system by uh, looking down what the checklist is for the rating score to get become lead certified and, and just making sure your building has all those things. But if you look at a, at a whole thing, like, you know, maybe Jay Leno's house is lead certified, but he has a huge garage with all these cars that are Humbers and whatnot. And so his net carbon footprint ends up being a lot bigger. Right if you look at it holistically as opposed to just the, the, the lead checklist, then I was wondering if you could comment on that. Right, yeah, I mean, it's not fun to design by checklist, to be honest, you know, I mean, some of the stuff's intuitive and you want to be innovative and try new things, but it's, I think it's, um, it's a useful tool for those that wouldn't be doing it anyway. Um, you know, if, if you're hiring a designer and they don't really know much about green, but you want to ensure you have a green building, say, well, certify it, then I'll know at least you've done this, this, and this. You know, it's just sort of a way to, to guarantee that something's not being lost or value engineered out of the process. Um, but certainly there are green, you know, greener buildings out there that may not be LEED certified. It's not the end all system, but it definitely, um, you have to cover several bases. You can't just get away with it by putting in recycled products. I mean, you have to deal with the site and water and energy to really, to be basically certified. So there are some things that, help improve and bring people up to a level they might not otherwise have achieved if not pushed to do so. So I think in that sense it's a good tool. Um, and it, you know, it's it's always evolving. They started out again with just new construction for basically office buildings. And now they have for existing buildings, for commercial interiors, for corn shell for developers, they have developing neighborhoods um, and housing. So it's, it's trying to diversify and create better tools available to different segments in the market. But you're right. I mean, there are definitely projects out there that designed by checklist to get the certification, and it's not very meaningful. Um, so you have to, you know, it's appropriate. And we're, just, we're doing a clinic right now in, um, in Utah Valley that will be certified. And, you know, they see it as they're the first to break ground, and, and, and that organization will be the first one to do it. And they want to sort of set the, set the bar for others to follow and be an example, as well as you know, they're visited by the general public and serve as an education tool. Um, for the general homeowner, I don't know that certifying your home is, you know, if you feel warm and fuzzy because you have the plaque, that's great, but um, you have to look at what you're in it for. <laughs> Sometimes you can spend the money that you would spend certifying the building, you know, it could be an expensive process to go through. You could spend that money and put it into a system to make your home more efficient and not go for the certification. You know, so that's an argument too. With a lot of our projects, that's what <coughs> people usually take. I hear that the International Building Code might be revised soon to actually incorporate some building, uh, some green building techniques. Do you know if that's true? And if so, what do you see on the horizon as far as what builders will have to shift toward? Hi, does anybody here know? I don't know where the code was headed in that regard. Sorry, From a policy perspective, I hear people at, at like the municipal level saying, well, you know, we'd, we'd like to try and incentivize green building and lead certification on new construction and renovation, but you know, why should we be the heavy? Because all we'll do is chase development out of our boundaries and they'll go to Sandy, you know. Yeah. That's and, definitely uh, happening, but to some success because um, I think said paving the way. So municipalities need to be the first to go. They can't, you know, require it of developers and then stand back and watch see what happens. They really need to set the example. I think Salt Lake City is attempting to do that by I think they said there's a you know, buildings over 10,000 square feet will be certified or silver. I can't remember which they set it at. But, you know, that's where you start, and then you create that demand in the market and interest, and then why not do it? You know, why would a developer build something that's not green? Because nobody's going to want to buy and move into it and pay the bills. So I think 
that's where it's headed from an optimistic view. <laughs> but I don't know where the code is in relation to that. Do you find that you can, kind of back to the economics, provide a building that um, meets the lead requirements and meets the program as, and is within budget, or or a home that is green and is is within budget, or do you find that it really does cost a lot more? Depends on what your baseline is. You know, if your baseline is the worst case scenario, then you're going to get by leading budget. Well, I think that's the way to go. <laughs> you know, two by four walls and minimal insulation and just skimming by, if you're comparing to that, yes, it's going to cost more. But if you're comparing just a quality, comfortable, you know, home, I mean, just your baseline is really where you're measuring against. And with Lee, typically, if you're going with the basic certification level, they have different levels. It's certified silver, gold, platinum. I don't know why it's the metals. For some reason, it should be, you know, oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this basic, you know, I've looked at some projects. We do the initial, if you're designing, check off the list, you know, which, which ones are no-brainers are we gonna do anyway? And then compare it to that, you know, to that. And a lot of times, certified is very easy to get, with just some pretty basic design choices. Um, and then once you jump up to silver, then it's you know, incremental. They say maybe two to five percent increase to silver, and then another, you know, five to seven. Platinum can get really out of hand. Um, but yeah, it's basic certification you can do pretty simply. We have time for this one more question. You made a, a, a really interesting comment that granite, granite countertops don't pay back. And I think we have to get out of this mentality of asking the question of how long does it take to pay back this extra cost? Uh, I put in a photovoltaic 1.4 kilowatt system on a detached garage this summer. And the October power bill was $4, half of which was the mandatory fee and so forth. And everyone asks me what the payback cost time is, and it's 24 years. Except if power bills go up, then the payback time comes down. So we're hoping for higher power. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the feel-good factor and, the, and just the interest in it is, is more than paid it in, in my sense. And living in these homes that you've designed, I would say you get that back immediately. Yeah, yeah just the satisfaction of doing Beautiful designs. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for all for listening.